About one in five of us will experience a mental health condition at some point in our life. If you or someone you know is coping with a mental health condition, you are not alone. And this podcast is for you today. We're going to talk all about it. Thanks so much for being with me, for living well with Robin Stoloff, empowering you to live a healthier life. I'm so excited to welcome Jamie Angelini. She is the Director of Special Projects for the Mental Health Association in New Jersey. Thanks for joining us, Jamie. Thanks for having me. You and I have talked about this for many, many years, and there is still a stigma attached to mental health, although it's getting better. Let's first start there with the stigma. Absolutely. I'm glad you said it's getting better. It is. Um, People's attitudes are shifting around mental health, but that stigma is still there, and it keeps people from reaching out for help and support. And sometimes it's because of fear or misunderstanding, um, lack of awareness, but that fear, that misunderstanding, that lack of awareness creates stigma, that's discrimination. And it impacts people who might be experiencing a mental health challenge. And it, it's a barrier to reaching out for support with them. Sure, there's a lot of people that are sort of in the camp of, oh, come on, just get over it. Is it really that bad? You can handle it. And you and I have talked about this analogy a million times. If you broke your leg, you wouldn't say, oh, just get over it. You would go and get help for it. And it's why is it that mental health is treated like a a lesser problem or an issue that you can just get over. I mean, that's great advice, but people can't just get over it, right? Yeah, you can't. You can't just snap out of it. We've all heard people say that. And, you know, looking at mental health and health the same way is so important because you're right. When it comes to our medical and our physical health, we immediately reach out. We reach out early. We get early screenings. um, And if someone in our life was struggling with a medical or physical health condition, we encourage them to get help and support. We're right there walking the journey with them. For some reason, when it comes to mental health, people look at it differently. Um, So changing the narrative is so important. And really looking at them equally and looking at whole health um, is is important. And That's a very good point. It's your whole health. Mental health is your health. It's not a separate issue. It's part of your entire life, really. And that's something that we really need to focus on. And it is, as you said, getting better. But it's important for us to be aware of what mental health challenges look like. Sometimes it's very subtle. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes when someone is first experiencing a mental health challenge, there's, like you said, subtle changes, changes in their mood, changes in their behavior, their feelings, their thoughts. And if we could pick up on those early and the importance of early intervention, I can't say it enough, reaching out for support early, recognizing, hey, I'm just not feeling myself. I'm just not doing the things I once liked to do. I don't feel as motivated. I feel sad or worried a lot of the time. So we look at frequency, duration, and impact. So how often are you feeling that way? And we can say that to someone else in our life, like, how, do you, how long have you been feeling this way? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, how long are their symptoms lasting? And is it impacting the things that you like to do, your everyday activities, um, and the things that you need to do? Sure. I mean, everyone gets down. Everyone Mm -hmm. feels anxious from time to time. But when it's persistent, when it keeps happening, that is really when you need to look into getting some help. And you have several ways for people to learn how to recognize these signs. Uh, QPR is one of them. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So QPR, Question, Persuade, Refer, is a program, uh, training program that we offer at the Mental Health Association. And that's focused on suicide prevention. Early intervention, if someone in our life, anyone, um, may be having thoughts of suicide, and it trains the layperson with no previous background or experience in suicide prevention to recognize the warning signs, but more importantly, to have the courage to lean in and say, I'm worried about you. We practice asking people, are you thinking about suicide? And that's a scary question to ask, but can save someone's life. So one of the gatekeeper, we call them gatekeeper trainings that we offer is QPR And it's available to anyone in the community. And it's just a way of noticing um, some of those early warning signs that someone's struggling because it's really hard for someone to say, hey, I'm thinking about suicide. You know, they may give indirect verbal clues. They might say things like, I'm tired of my life. I just can't go on. And for us to have the courage to say, hey, stop. What did you mean by that? I'm here to support you. You don't have to be afraid. Um, And again, breaking that stigma and talking about suicide openly is, is really important. And let's just address that because a lot of people believe that if you say the word suicide to someone, 
you'll give them the idea. And that is just a fallacy. It is the biggest myth out there that if we talk about suicide or we ask about it, we would give someone the idea. One of the things that we talk about in that training is that we can talk about it openly. Because if someone's thinking about it, they're more likely to open up if we ask about it. So if nothing else, um, we want people to know it's okay to talk about it openly. And we've changed the language around suicide. We've shifted. We no longer say committed suicide. Um, we say someone died by suicide. So even changes in language to reduce stigma, talk about it in a neutral way, um, we have found is also really important. You also have mental health first aid, which I took both of these mental health first aid and QPR and you just do a wonderful training, Jamie. I have to tell you, it's they're so valuable for all of us to know this. Tell us a little yeah, more about that. Sure. Um, another wonderful gatekeeper training designed for the public, for anyone in the community, um, evidence-based like QPR. And this is where, you know, throughout the day, and it's a certification course, people recognize, learn to recognize early signs and symptoms. What might it look like if someone in your life was showing early signs? or worsening signs, or was in crisis, and what would you say, what would you do? Um, the program focuses on reducing stigma and increasing mental health literacy, and it takes us through not just what a mental health disorder is, because we're not diagnosing, that's not the role of a mental health first aider, but noticing changes in behaviors and thoughts and feelings, and being able to say to someone, I'm concerned about you. I'm worried, how can I help you? And encouraging them to get the support that they need. So it might be encouraging professional help, um, but not for everybody. Not everyone needs professional help. It might be encouraging some self-help strategies. A big piece of our action plan is listening non-judgmentally, which sounds really easy to do, um, but we practice that in the class and being able to open that door for someone who might be experiencing a mental health challenge to, uh, to open up. And all of these gatekeeper trainings, um, they play a huge part in early intervention and that's the importance of it. Absolutely. And are they offered both in person and online? Yeah, absolutely. In person and virtual. So we really try to meet people where they are um, when they want to take the training. We do a lot of trainings for businesses and organizations. We're seeing um, a real shift in workplaces and corporations wanting to focus on mental health wellness um, for their employees. So that's another thing that we've been doing a lot. I'm really excited about that to, to see, you know, the people opening their eyes, their hearts, their minds to wanting to focus on mental health and well-being um, for everyone in their life. Let's talk about some of the coping strategies that you mentioned. I mean, of course, there's professional counseling and therapy available, but as you said, there might be some self-help strategies that people can also turn to. Absolutely. And it has to be what works for the person. Um, so whether it is prayer or meditation or music or walking or exercise, um, whatever it is, we try to really talk about putting together a self-care plan, a self-care action plan. And everybody should have one, not just if you are experiencing a mental health challenge, not just if you're struggling with a mental illness, but every one of us. Um, and we look at what's called the eight dimensions of wellness. Um, listeners can look that up and learn much more about that. But it focuses on this balanced approach to wellness. So how am I doing in you know, the domain of spiritual wellness? and physical wellness and environmental wellness, and really thinking about how do I put together this plan and write it down on paper, change it when you need to, but have coping strategies that you can go to when you're in need of support is, um, is really important when we talk about mental health and well-being. I really love that. Whether or not you are coping with a mental health condition, it's probably a good idea to do something like that. Just check in with yourself. We are, you know, we have a lot of elements to our lives. And so where are we as far as, as you said, our physical health or our spiritual health or, you know, just taking time to enjoy life a little bit where some people are just working, working, working or taking care of the kids and they don't really have a second to do anything for themselves. And that can be where things start to add up and people start to have a problem. So I love that you talked about that, you know, having some self-help strategies, whether or not, I mean, this can be preventive too as well, right? Absolutely. And we, we don't want people to wait till they're so stressed or so anxious or feeling so sad that then it's time to reach out. Um, reaching out early, having that self-care plan, taking, you know, the same way we would, we would take a temperature um, on how, how we're doing physically, take a temperature on your stress level and, and do it with people in your life. See how others are doing in your family or in your workplace. 
And taking that temperature helps because then we can reach out early or you could say to someone else in your life, hey, I've noticed and I'm concerned about you. Um, and saying it in a way that's non-judgmental is super helpful. I know we really, COVID really shined a light on loneliness being a, a very difficult issue and leading to mental health conditions. Can you talk a little bit about that and the importance of having relationships in your life, even if it's one relationship? Yeah. And so important connection for people is so important. And I know we've talked about that a lot during COVID. Um, you know, the pandemic shined a light on the importance of mental health, which, which is a good thing, but it also really allowed people, I think, to realize the importance of having connection and relationship and and if they're not doing well, healing in community and healing in relationships with other people. And it doesn't have to be five or 10 or 20 people. It could be that one good person. Um, one of the other things that we talk about in some of these workshops is writing down the names of the people who are part of your support team, part of your support system, um, and having people to go to. You know, even years as we're moving through the pandemic, people are still talking about that feeling of loneliness and that loss of connectivity. Um, so finding ways to get that back, I, I think is really important. That happened a lot in workplaces. We, we started working from home and in some cases, many businesses continued that. They found that people were still productive and maybe they saved a little bit on rent, office space and so forth. So there's many times that sometimes people will go through their entire day. If they don't have a family, they haven't seen another human being. Yeah. And I would say maybe schedule that time in the same way you're scheduling your meetings and your appointments, schedule time in to meet a friend, you know, for, for coffee or for a walk, whatever you need um, for a FaceTime or a Zoom. But putting that in and making it a priority, I, I, I think is, is something that, you know, would be important for people. But sometimes we have to write it down. We have to schedule it for ourselves so that we make sure we do it. We don't just go through the day and not connect. You mentioned writing something down now a couple of times. So I'm going to ask you about journaling or writing your thoughts, even if it's just for a few minutes a day. How important is that? It really is important because as we know, those of us who are, are working all the time, if we don't write it down, we forget to do it. And we make that a priority for our workplaces and, you know, for doctor's appointments and things for our family. So writing down those things, um, writing down your feelings, your thoughts, Sometimes at the end of the day, doing kind of like a brain dump, you know, getting it all out. Um, but also gratitude journaling has been something that's been so helpful. Just writing down one thing you're grateful for every day, whether it's first thing in the morning or at the end of the evening. Um, and if anyone hasn't tried it, give it a try and, and see if it works for you. If it doesn't, that's okay. But there's been a lot of positive, um, you know, output from using journaling and, and writing. Yes. For, and for and if you prefer, there's a million apps out there. You can do it digitally. You can even speak into it if you prefer mm -hmm. to do that. There's one that I use that I do that with if I just don't feel like writing, you know, writing longhand. Although there's something to that, I think sometimes when you actually write on paper, but that can be very helpful. And it can also go the other way. If you're upset about something, sometimes you can let it out. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you're upset and you want to write someone a letter and you never really send it, <laughs> but you've yes. gotten out. Great exercise. Thoughts, you yeah. know, yeah. And it just feels good. It's sort of like release it. Just now it's gone. I've let it out, you know, and that's a good way to do it. But paying attention to our lives is really, I think, kind of the bottom line here, Jamie, is what we're talking about. Paying attention to ourselves, but not just ourselves, but our family members. And let's talk a little bit about kids. You and I both have kids. They're getting a little older now, but no matter how old they are, they're still our children. And a lot of times, children have mental health issues and we, we tend to think, oh, what kind of problems could kids have? But they they have problems in their world, just like we have problems in ours. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So that one in five number relates to our teenagers also. So one in five of our young people um, will experience a mental health disorder. So we want to make sure that we are focusing on their mental health, that we're not just thinking, oh, this will pass. This is typical adolescence. It might be. But sometimes, you know, giving it more attention and stopping and saying to our, our teenagers, our young people, you know, how are you doing? I've noticed some changes in your mood. I'm really concerned. Um, the pediatricians now are doing depression screenings. I'm so happy about that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot happening in the high schools in New Jersey. We've been part of that at the Mental Health Association. 
where we are training, um, working with the schools to train teenagers in mental health first aid, teen mental health first aid, so they can look out for early signs in themselves and in a friend, and most importantly, tag in a trusted adult. But we want to look for changes, anything that's different. So if there are parents that are watching us today, anything that's different, um, just ask some questions, investigate it a little bit. You know, again, just like we said with medical and physical health, we don't want to wait until it gets worse. We want to intervene early and see what we can do to support our young people. Really important. That is health. a great program. How do the teens receive it? It seems to me that teens today are a little bit more open-minded about these types of issues yeah. as opposed to maybe in the past where it just wasn't discussed. It was something you swept under the rug. They are receiving it so well. So in just one school year, um, our project trained over 3,600 teenagers in New Jersey high schools. And they're receiving it well. They want this information. They want to be able to talk about their mental health and suicide prevention. They put together their wellness plan. So it's um, it's been really well received. And they know so much. And they're much more willing to talk about it. There's less stigma than you might think. So a lot, and a lot of openness. So it's it's been really exciting to see that happen. Well, I guess a lot of that has to do with the way we live our lives online now and, and nobody more than teenagers, everything they do, I'm eating a sandwich. Let me take a picture of it, right? right? It's just everything. And so a lot of that I think has to do with that, but also the fact that you will see celebrities or sports figures, people that are in the public eye talk about their mental health. And to me, that's a big change because you would never have heard that many years ago. People would have kept something like that to themselves for fear that it might ruin their career. Yeah, and I think, um, like I had said earlier, attitudes are changing. And I think the more people um, in the public figures, public eye, celebrities and athletes speak out and individuals hear that, then it, it makes it so that, oh, wow, this can impact any one of us. And that's the message is that mental health challenges can impact any one of us. And early intervention is the key and reaching out. So the more people that talk about it, and I think if someone is experiencing or even struggling, they may be more likely to say, okay, if this person could reach out and have the courage to talk about it and get support, um, so can I. And recovery is possible and probable. And that's also a message we want to say consistently, um, that recovery is possible, help is available, really important. And, and you see that, and you see that all the time. And I remember asking you one time about addiction. And, and I said, mm -hmm. is addiction first and then mental health issues or is it mental health and addiction and you were like it could be either or it, it could, could either go either or. way they're but they're connected in many ways can you talk yeah. about that yeah so we see a lot of what they call co-occurrence um, of individuals experiencing a mental health challenge and a substance use challenge or substance use disorder um, and it's important to treat both so not just looking at the substance use and not just looking at the mental health challenges and it's important to find the right clinician or the right support group or the right organization who can look at both um, and treat both. But it's not about one or the other. We have found that treating both has been really, really helpful. And we'll never know which, which came first. Um, but the idea that if someone is struggling, if that substance use or mental health challenge is getting in the way of their work and their daily activities and their relationships, um, reach out and, and find that right treatment, that right support or that right option for you. Reach out. I mean, that that really is the message here. Reach out. Don't be afraid to talk to someone about it and don't be afraid to learn more about it. I mean, there is, there's so much training available. And once again, can you please just tell us how we can access it and what training is available? Yeah, absolutely. So if people are interested in learning more about mental health first aid, or QPR suicide prevention, or any of the support groups um, and educational groups that we have, go to our website, mhanj.org, to learn more about what we do at the Mental Health Association in New Jersey. Thank you so much, Jamie Angelini, Director of Special Projects for the Mental Health Association in New Jersey. As always, Jamie, you were fantastic. So much good information. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for being with me for Living Well with Robin Stoloff, empowering you to live a healthier life. Please like and subscribe, and I'll keep you posted on my most recent episode. Until I see you next time, keep living well.